Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning to our students online as well. Okay, let's just say a word of prayer before we begin this session. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to come together and just study your word. And even as we learn about evangelism, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak to our hearts, O oh God. Minister to us. Give us wisdom. Give us the grace to understand and to apply everything that we learn in each of our lives, oh God. We come at this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So last class we went into chapter 2. We talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we established some facts. We established what the gospel is and what the message of the cross is. Right? And we saw that, you know, what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, 17, he says, the gospel is the message of the cross. So the moment we, you and I, as believers, if we want to reach out to people, if we want to minister to people, all we need is the gospel. Nothing more, nothing less. In Indian terms, don't need to add any more masala to it. Let it be as it is. Because the cross is the power of God unto salvation. It is foolishness to those who are perishing. But, right? So there will be times you, you will be sharing the gospel with somebody. They may think it is foolish. Uh, you can't do anything about it. Don't add something to it. Don't try to make it fancy and sound fancy. As simple as it is, it is the power of God to salvation. Right? Then we looked at the Greek word sozo, which is a comprehensive word, and it has so many, you know, uh, so many things involved in that one word sozo. Right? Uh, there's forgiveness, healing of sins, sickness, healing from diseases, deliverance, and all of that. Right? And today we'll get into page 12, the gospel in five minutes. Now, as we've established the fact that all we need is the gospel, meaning we just preach about Jesus, how do I preach? How do I speak? Right Now, some of us may wonder, how do I, how do I share the gospel? How do I start off? Is it, is it something that I should do? Is it something that I shouldn't do? Right? We may have a lot of questions. Now, it's not wrong to have questions, but it's wrong not to try something, not to try it out, not to take that first step. right? So we're going to learn now how you and I can share the gospel in five minutes. And remember, we're in a time and age when people don't want to spend too much time talking. For example, you're going out on outreach. You don't hold that person and say, listen, I'll talk to you about Abraham. Isaac and Jacob and Moses and, you know, what Jonah did in the belly of the fish and what Daniel did with the lion's den. They don't have time for all of that. You have maybe just three or four minutes to preach the gospel, to share the gospel. And that time should be given effectively. Right? So we look at it. Now, one of the ways of sharing the gospel in five minutes is the four spiritual laws. Now, Let's look at these verses, right? First one, every man is a sinner. So Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 23. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. Okay, we've got to be quick in uh, finding the verses, please, so that we can move on fast. Yes, go ahead, anyone. Romans 3, verse 10. There is no one righteous, not even one. That's what is written, right? So as we minister to somebody, we can bring out the fact that every person being born in this world is born in sin. It doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter which place. Every person is born a sinner, right? Secondly, you say sin has its consequences. Now, again, we must be careful how we, how we bring this out. We don't speak it in a way that we are judging somebody. 
right? So for example, you're, you're ministering to a person who is an unbeliever. Don't go to them and say, you know what? You are a sinner. I'm a sinner. Don't do that way, right? The, the way we use our words is very important. See, God gives us the wisdom, right? The truth is there. The gospel is there. But God gives us the wisdom on how to express ourselves, how to minister to each other, right? So learn to choose words rightly. So we, we bring in the fact, okay, see, just because we are, we are born in this world, we are born in sin, right? So you can give them a little example. You don't teach a five-year-old boy how to lie. You don't, right? The first time I, my kids came up to me, they said something. I knew it's a lie. I didn't say, who taught you how to lie? No, it's, it's sin nature. They're born in sin, right? And then sin has its consequences. Let's read Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Maybe somebody else can open Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Behold, the Lord hand is on not shorted, that is, cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that is, can't, cannot hear, but your iniquities has separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his fa face from you, so that he will not hear. Right. Romans 6.23. This you should know. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, sin has its consequences. Now, when you look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1 all the way up to chapter 39 talks about judgment. Right Now, this is only for you. While you're sharing the gospel, don't go back to Isaiah. Right? You're just, I'm just giving you a backdrop. The people of Israel were living in sin. They're living in sexual immorality. They are living in... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, worshipping other gods, being idols, living in sin. They forgot the God of Israel. And God is speaking to Isaiah and he's saying, listen, you are going far away from me. Even though I'm calling you, you're drawing, you're going away from me. Now, the more you go away from me, there's going to be consequences for these sins. And later on, we know that you know, the Babylonians came and destroyed uh, the Jerusalem and took these people captive. And they were under the control of the uh, Babylonian kingdom. But even in that, God is promising the people of Israel, I will restore you. I will bring you back to your nation. You know, sometimes we read the Old Testament and we think God is so cruel. He's not. He's a loving God. Right? He's, he just has his eyes on us. He's saying, don't go away. If you go away, I will still love you. But there are consequences to sin. Right? And so when you are bringing out this point, you and I can just say, you know, sin has its consequences. We may, uh, we may end up doing the wrong things at the wrong time. And it can affect our lives. So then you bring out God's love and Christ's provision to bring us back to him. Now, when sin came into this world, sin separated us from God. Right? Now, now, these things that I'm going to explain is just for us to understand. Right? In the Old Testament, there was one day called the Day of Atonement where the high priest will go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of a ram and he would pour that blood on the altar of sacrifice. Now, what was that blood for? That happens only once a year. So the high priest will go in on behalf of the nation of Israel. All the sins of Israel is held in that cup. And the moment that high priest would go in and put that blood, God decides, I will not remember the sins of the people of Israel no more. I will not remember it. I will not bring judgment upon them. That's called the Day of Atonement. Now, after the Lord Jesus died and he resurrected from the dead, what did he do? The Bible says, Hebrews chapter, chapter 10, he says he, he, he took his own blood. He went into the Holy of Holies and he made atonement for you and me. 
So this time, it is not the blood of rams and goats, but it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Imagine this. In the Old Testament, there was fear. History says that they would you know, put a chain around the high priest's leg. And if that person, the high priest, has sinned and has any unconfessed sin, he will drop down dead in the presence of God. And they had a way to pull him out. But Paul writes and he says, Now we have the confidence to enter the throne of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. So you talk about the cross. This is where we come in. This is where we can spend most of our time. We say, see, through Jesus, you know, we were separated from God because of our sin. The Lord Jesus shed his blood on the cross for us. That when he died on the cross, he took up our sins. He took up our shame, our diseases, our sickness, everything. And he died on the cross, he resurrected from the dead, and he made atonement for you and me. That's the cross. That's the message of the cross, the gospel. And now you and I don't have to live in sin. So it is God bringing his people back to him. So you can explain it. right? And then you say, when you believe in this cross, you will be saved. Now, again, as you say this, you may have many questions running in your mind. You may have many thoughts. Is it, you know, it's not making sense or will this person believe? Will he not believe? Don't worry about that. Our responsibility is to share this message. This is more than enough. Four spiritual laws. Every man is a sinner. Sin has its consequences. God sent his only son, John 3.16, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Then you can ask them to believe and they are saved. That's just simple, just five minutes. Now, if you have the opportunity to spend more time with a person as they're sharing the gospel, you can take time, explain it with them. But if you don't have time, it's that five minutes is enough, right? Then we have a different second way is from Genesis to the point of Jesus Christ being born, right? Uh, first one, creation of man, its purpose, right? So one of the ways that I get to share the gospel with people is I always talk to them about what is your purpose in life? What do you want to be? Let's say I want to be a doctor, engineer. Yeah, but what is the purpose? What happens after that? Right? You get them to start thinking. Right? And so you bring out the purpose, the creation of man. God created us to have a relationship with us. Remember that relationships are eternal. Right? Meaning a person can have, you know, uh, uh, relationships are something that are long lasting, it's not something that is easily forgotten. Right? Why did God create man? You bring out the point. You know, God created man because he wants to have a relationship with us. Then you talk about the fall of man and its consequences. Again, very similar to the second point here. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Go ahead. Anyone can read, please. Therefore. Just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Yep. For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Now what less death is... No, verse 12 alone, right? Yeah. So, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in the same way, death came to all men because all have sinned. Right? Now, here, the fall of man. You're talking to a person, you say, okay, see, God did not design death. When God created this world, he didn't say, I'm going to design death. Death came into this world because of Adam and the sin that he made. Death is a consequence of sin. God did not design death. 
And when Jesus came into this world, he came and he defeated death. Let's read that uh, just to give you a context. Paul writes in his epistle, uh, epistle of First Corinthians, chapter fifteen, and he writes it so beautifully here. Uh, I'm just going to read that, right? Uh, chapter fifteen and verse forty-four. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true: Death has been swallowed up. In victory, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, think of this the moment Adam and Eve sinned, death came into this world. Now, death is physical separation. When the Lord Jesus came, when he died on the cross, and the moment he resurrected from the dead, this verse is applicable. He says, where, O oh, death, is your sting? Because Satan brought death. Jesus defeated death. Right now, Jesus is, is it's not like Jesus is, um, you know, just some spirit. But Paul writes in Timothy, to the letter in Timothy, he says, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. He's got a resurrected body, and that is the same body you and I will have. Right? Why? Because death has been defeated. And so it says here that the fall of man, the consequence is death. But Jesus has defeated death on the cross. And he resurrected again. Then we look at man's attempt to reach God. You know, we try to reach God in the book of in the Old Testament. What is happening there? What's happening in the Old Testament? God is teaching the people of Israel and he's saying, see, you all have sinned and you are trying to you know, obey and to listen to what I'm saying, but there is this separation. So, he, so God instructs Moses and he says, these are the things you have to do. The sin offering, the guilt offering, the pain offering, the, all of these offerings are man's attempt to reach God. And if you're speaking to a person from another faith, you talk to them, you can tell them, see, we, by nature, want to attempt to reach God. Whatever faith they are in. Right? It's an attempt to reach God. But here, God makes an attempt to reach man. Let's read 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is love. Not that we loved him, but he loved us first, that he came down to make propitiation for our sins. That means to pay the price, to make penalty for the sins that we have done. And so God reaches out to man. Then the invitation is to believe. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, that's the word that we must look at, whoever believes in him, it doesn't matter who it is, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Right? And so we invite the person to believe. Now, here's the thing that we must understand, right? There will be rejections. There will be people who will ridicule. There will be people who will not believe, right? Now, just because they don't believe doesn't mean we have to take a step back or doesn't mean we, we should change the way we live, right? We stay true to God's word. Does God's word change? It's constant. It never changes. Just because a big scientist says that from the you know one species came and then uh, from that uh, all of us were born, just because he's the greatest scientist or physician, doesn't mean that we have to change the way we live. 
we know the gospel is true. We know what the word of God is. Right? Let me give you this example. It's a funny illustration, but it, it makes a lot of sense. There was this teacher who was an atheist. An atheist is a person who doesn't believe in God. So this teacher was teaching children who were five or six years old children in this classroom and said, you know, there is no God. And I can prove it to you that there's no God. So the teacher chooses one little girl. And this girl was a Christian. And she, the teacher knew it. So she said, you come here. Go outside. Look at the trees and come. So this little girl goes, comes back. Did you see the trees, the teacher asked. She said, yes, I saw the trees. OK, go outside. Look at the building and come. So the little girl goes out, comes back. The teacher asks, did you see the building? Yes. Go outside. Look at the clouds and come. So the little girl goes out, sees it, and did you see the clouds? The little girl says, yes. Now go outside and see God and come. So the little girl goes out and comes back, and the teacher asks, did you see God? She says, no. And the uh, teacher says, so that's why there is no God. Now the little girl was confused. She said, teacher, I have a, something to tell you. You go out, see the trees, and come. So the teacher went. Did you see the trees? Yes. You go out, see the building, and come. The teacher went, did the same thing. Then the little girl said, you go out, see your brains, and come. So the teacher, the little girl asked, did you see your brains? No. That means you don't have brains. So what does it mean? It means that just because we can't see doesn't mean it's not there. What does the Bible say? The just shall live by faith. Right? So the point is, we are doing our part. Where is the cross? People will ask you. Where is Jesus? He's in Jerusalem. He's in heaven. Where is heaven? Now, don't go into the details of trying to, you know, if you know that they are ridiculing or making mockery out of it, just move on. Right? Don't worry about it. You don't have to prove to everyone at times. What did Jesus do? In, when he went to his own hometown, they said, his own brother said, this, this, you're Jesus. You're saying you're the Messiah, no? Go to the Feast of the Tabernacles. Tell everyone you're the Messiah. He says, I'm not going to do that. Just because you told me, should I do it? Jesus didn't do it. In some places where he went, he shook, shook the dust off his feet. He said, I don't want to be here because no matter what I say, no matter what I do, you're not believing. He just moved on. Right? So there will be times people will you know, not accept your message, but the message does not change. It remains constant. Amen? Right? So these are two ways you can preach, share the gospel in five minutes. Right? One of the things that I personally do is I bring in a lot of verses. When you bring in Bible verses, the Bible is, is something that penetrates people's heart. Let's read Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, perishing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it is discerners of thoughts and Intense of the heart. Yeah. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates into a person. It goes deep into their soul, into their spirit. So even as you're ministering, make sure that as you're ministering, you're sharing about the cross, give them a Bible verse. Give them a word which they can hold on to. And that word can go and minister to their hearts, right? It, it will go into their spirit. See, we can say 10 or 20 things to a person, but one word from the word of God is more valuable than 20 things that we say. Why? Because the word of God is more powerful. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates into our soul. It can even... You know, it discerns the thoughts of a person. You know, it can speak deep into the person's spirit. Something that we cannot do. Only the word of God can do. 
right? So get into this habit of reading the word, writing down these verses. You know, if you have a book, write down these verses. Write down verses that you like and be ready to share the gospel. Now, if somebody asks you, some, you know, you're sharing the gospel, don't say one minute, let me check in the Bible. And by the time he'll get bored and leave. So you got to be alert. You got to be quick. You got to understand. Ask the Holy Spirit to use what you have in you and release it. What you have is what you study, is what you prepare. The Holy Spirit takes it out of that and he ministers to people. Amen? Right? So keep doing that. Now, let's look at the two-minute testimony. Now, two minutes. How do I share the gospel in two minutes? Not when, you know, you're having tea with your friend. It's break time. And you're having tea with your friend. And how will you share the gospel? Right? So, your salvation experience. How was your life before you met Christ? We can share with the person. You know, before I met Christ, uh, this is how I was. I was living a reckless life. I was living in sin, um, you, know, you know, doing these things, which is against God. But then what happened was I want, once I went to church or somebody shared the gospel with me, I accepted Christ. And the moment I accepted Christ, everything changed in my life. Um, every sin, every every fear, everything that I had in my spirit, everything was taken off and I felt free. And now after my life has changed, you know, uh, I find meaning, I, feel, I find purpose in my life, all that fear, loneliness, rejection, everything is removed and I feel that God is with me. Just two minutes. How your life was, how you met Christ and the changes that happen after you met Christ. Now, if you get an opportunity after that to minister even more, bring in the cross. But these are just a few things. Right. Now, let me give you an example. When I was in school, uh, everyone knew that you know I was into these bad habits and in college as well. So recently, a couple of years back, we had this uh, the college you know the get together they have uh, like ten years. Uh, what is that called? Yeah, reunion and all of those stuff. So I normally don't go for it, right? Because they all they all meet in a pub and all of that. But then for many years I didn't go. And then a couple of years back, I went. <laughs> now it's funny for a preacher to get into a pub, but I went, right? So I went in and all the friends were there. We were all there, we were all talking, and they said, Okay, what will you drink? I said apple juice. Apple juice. What, you know, which, what do you want? I said, no, I don't want. So what, Paul? You have fully changed. What happened to you? Are you become a father? Or are you become what's what's happening? Right? Are you a priest? What was happening? Give me an opportunity. You ask the question. Now you have to listen. So I began to share. I said, see, all you boys are sitting here. All this I have done when I was in 18 years old. So you guys are doing it now. But let me tell you what happened to me in my life. And I shared. I said, this is what, you know, they were all, you know, smoking and drinking. And some of them were laughing at me. I said, hey, Paul, enough. Yeah, don't start preaching here. This is, but I continued. It was my opportunity. So I, I, I kept sharing. See, this is how I was. Now, then after that, you know, God just changed my life. And now all of this means nothing to me. It means nothing. You can do all of this will not bring fulfillment in your life. You know it. I know it. Some of them put off their cigarettes. Some of them moved the alcohol and they began to listen. There were about, I think, 14, 15 of them. I just shared very simple five minutes. Just you know how my life was, how God changed my life and how things have been for me. And how there's a hope, there's a joy, there's happiness. There's no fear. I'm not addicted to uh, alcohol or any of these things. The, as I was sharing, many of them, I could see a tear coming down from their eyes. Where are we? The pub. 
and we finished and uh, I, I didn't say can you pray with me all of that no we finished I said okay we're gonna go and then as I came out four of them came to me and said I want to know what happened to you I said okay come we sat we began to speak we spoke we spoke all four of them the next day gave their life to Christ all four of them right now the, the day after that some of them were very angry right they, they called me hey you told me about this Jesus no you know what happened to my family my father died my mother died and this this happened that happened I said okay I understand all of it but did it bring happiness to you 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 put a couple of drinks you had a couple of smokes but did it bring happiness to you I said no so you're trying to fill that emptiness with all of this I said yes any hope no hope so you might as well listen to what I'm saying listen to the message that I'm so then they began to listen out of 14 of them 12 of them gave their life to Christ all 12 of them gave their life to Christ two of them have not yet given their life to Christ but it's okay the point is how was my life what happened after I received Christ and how God changed my life now, they're all believers I'm not saying they're pastors and serving God and all of that but they're believers and they go to church every Sunday they're serving in church they've given up all the bad habits why this God is the only one who can do that right so you when you are sharing the gospel you got to understand God's power you need to know that God can do it if there is doubt we need to overcome that doubt and we'll learn more on that right so then another way is through experiencing divine intervention what was your need right there was a need in your life the Lord you know supernaturally provided it and what the Lord Jesus can do for that person and then you just lead them to the salvation prayer now this is an important portion here the work of the Holy Spirit towards the unsaved now what are we doing we are sharing the gospel right we are sharing the gospel that but there is a work that the Holy Spirit is doing behind the scenes that we don't know now all I did or all that people do is we share the gospel we are using the words we are speaking the Bible but the Holy Spirit backs up that word it's not about me it's not about the person it's not because I went to that place and I shared the gospel I used the right words I used the right time not about all of that right it was about the Holy Spirit using that moment he, the Holy Spirit knows what's happening in those 14 boys what was happening in their lives for the 12 of them who are just hurting inside the Holy Spirit knew it I didn't know it but the Holy Spirit began to work in their lives just just like you know the Word of God living and powerful sharper than a double-edged sword they went back home one of them said I didn't sleep the whole night I was thinking of what you were saying did I keep him awake the whole night I went home and slept ate and slept happily of the Word of God the Holy Spirit just come on something wrong in your life you got to change your life so now we look at what the work of the Holy Spirit is John chapter 16 was 8 through 10 go ahead read that John 16 8 through 10 John chapter 16 8 through 10 And when he has come, he will convict the world sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Yeah, go on. Let's read one more verse. Of judgment because the ruler of the world is judged. I still have many things to do. To say to you but you can't bear them now however when he the spirit of truth has came he will guide you yeah. into yeah so when he comes talking about the Holy Spirit he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment what will the Holy Spirit do he will 
convict. What is the meaning of conviction? Very important to understand these words. When we sin and we know that we have sinned, and there's that feeling in your heart and your spirit it says, Oh man, I did something wrong. I shouldn't have done this. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He convicts the unbeliever of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So all we are doing is preaching the gospel. The Holy Spirit is doing the conviction. He's penetrating to that person's heart. He's saying, see, this, you know, it, it can be anybody who's sharing, but the Holy Spirit is using those words and penetrating, right? He's bringing conviction into his spirit. Oh, yes, I've done something wrong. I'm doing something wrong, right? I, I don't have to live this way. I don't have to live in this sin. Whose work is that? It's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? So remember that when you are ministering, you are not alone. The Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit will take control, right? All we're doing is sharing, but the Holy Spirit is just, you know, backing you up with all his power. Now, there are times we, the other person may not believe in Christ. Don't feel the Holy Spirit didn't do his work. He did his work. But probably there are things in, in that person's life which is too strong. There are bondages or things that are happening that is too strong. And God has his own way of dealing with that. But our goal is to share the gospel and expect the Holy Spirit to do the convicting. Amen? Our, that's our goal. Share the gospel, the Holy Spirit will do the convicting. Anything we share from the word, you say, God, give me the right word at the right time to speak. And this, when, when I speak, Lord, you bring conviction. Whatever words I say, Lord, you minister to those people's heart. Right? You minister to them. And this one time, uh, we were in the city of Mangalore. And uh, I don't want to give too many examples. Okay, last example. I was sitting in, in the city of Mangalore, and um, you know those guys who, you know, who whip themselves on the road. They walk and they whip themselves on the road, and then they ask you for some money. And this one time, we were outside. I was outside. I don't know what for, but we were outside, and uh, this guy all of a sudden came, and he started hitting himself hardly. Right, and uh, it was somewhere in the afternoon, very hot. I wanted to go home, and I was just so irritated that day. He was hitting himself, and uh, and he was saying, proclaiming something about some god. And um, I said, I don't have money, please. I, I need to go. He was not letting me go, saying you have to give. So from where will I give? I don't have the money with me right now. Who's going to go to the bank, ATM, and withdraw money and all? Give you? I don't have time for all that. He said, you have to give. I won't let you go. And he you know, started making a scene. In the, uh, I was actually outside on the road. So he started making a scene. You have to give me. I will not let you go. Otherwise, I'll take this whip and whip you. I said, you touch me and see how it's going. I'm not afraid of it. But then you know, he said, I'll whip you. I said, OK, you do what you want. You stand, I'll stand. At that moment, I thought, the reason he's not letting me go is he wants money, but God has another plan. God wants this fellow to listen to the gospel. I said, sit down. Let's talk. Why you won't let me go? No, I want money. So I'll give you something better than money. Silver and gold have I none. What I have, I'll give to you. That's the verse that came to me at that moment. So I said, sit down. He was bare body and all of it. And he said, uh, you know why? Give me your watch, he said. I said, I'll not give you my watch. You first listen. You listen to me, I'll listen to you. So then we began to talk. Now, as we were talking, the Holy Spirit started to, you know, I was just normal. I was not sharing the gospel, just talking simple things. I said, Why are you doing this? What you can't work, you're 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 healthy, right? You can work. I'll get you a job. What do you what did you study? He said, I've done my bachelor's in commerce. Then what are you doing here? No, you won't understand all of that. He said, No, I'll get you a job. And, and we were talking, and he said, no, I don't want to work. I don't have a family. I don't have anybody. So as we were talking, I knew that something was wrong. 
I, as we were talking, I saw a house that was burning. In, in my mind's eye, I saw that. So I asked him, what happened? How did you lose your family? He said, why should I tell you? I, you? You first give me the money and I need to go. I said, did your house get burned down? He was in shock. I said, yes. When he had gone out, his, his father, his mother, and his brother, all three of them died when his house burned down. Because there was a gas leak, it just exploded, it burned down. He was so bitter about the whole thing. And he asked me, how did you know? I said, thank you for asking. I said, this is what, I just began to share the gospel with him. This is what the Holy Spirit is. This is what Jesus does. He restores us. I know these things. And I began to just simply share the gospel. In the middle of the conversation, he put his hand in his bag. He took out his bag. He wore his shirt. In the middle of the conversation, he took water, he washed his face. 45 minutes into the discussion, he gave his life to Christ. Did a prayer with him. I said, you, you pray with me. He prayed. And he decided to change his life forever. Right? He changed his life. Right? And he, he just uh, you know, got planted in a church. And right now, he's working in one of the IT companies here. So the point is, there are times we don't understand but God can use something, when, especially when we are not ready, God can use those opportunities to help us bring people to Christ. Right? So our goal is to share and expect the Holy Spirit to do the ministry. Right? Thirdly, let's go to chapter 3. Any questions? What's the difference between conviction and conscious? Conviction, the Holy Spirit brings conviction to sin in our spirit. Conscience is something that we know is wrong and we purposefully do it. Right? Our conscience tells us, hey, this is not right. Sometimes there are sins that we you know, unknowingly commit sins. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He says, this is not right. This is something that you have to change in your life. So there's a there's a difference, but not a big difference. Remember, we you know in Holy Spirit we'll talk about it how the Holy Spirit and our spirit work together. So He uses our five senses to minister to us, right? So it's it's very similar conscience and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we just have seven minutes left, so I think we'll stop here and then we'll get into power and love. So here's the thing. I have an assignment for you. Not writing and not uh, all of that, but uh, one of the days you'll go out for outreaches. Yes? OK. Here's what I want you to do, OK? But, 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 don't make it like, oh, assignment. You know, Don't get fully stressed out. Just think about it this way. Lord, you take me to the right person. There will be hundreds of students passing by. You take me to the right person. And Lord, you put the right words in my mouth. And Lord, give me a word of knowledge or a word for the person that I have to speak to. Just give me one person, Lord. One person that I can talk to. Shall we do that? Right? This week, a couple of weeks. Those online as well, wherever you are, just think of it this way. God, lead me to one person right, where I can minister to them and share the gospel with them. Whether they accept Christ or not, we'll see that later. If they accept Christ, good. But if they don't, it's okay. You have already sown a seed. But you pray and ask God, God, give me one opportunity, one person that I can share the gospel with. Lead me to that person. So this entire week, or the coming two weeks at least, you pray about this intentionally. Right? Let's take a couple of minutes and pray and say, God, Lead me to the right person. It could be somebody here in your outreaches, somebody near your workplace, anyone. Right? Lord, lead me to the person, one person that I can share the gospel with. Shall we do that? That's our assignment. And maybe a couple of weeks down the line, we'll just uh, share our uh, learnings from all of this. Right? OK, any other question? Shall we close in prayer? OK, let's close.
Father, we want to thank you so much for your word, O oh God. We thank you for teaching us how to minister the gospel, O oh God. And even as we go about doing this, we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. That you convict the world of righteousness and judgment and sin, O oh God. And I pray, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts even as we read your word. Lord, your word will bring clarity, will bring truth into our spirit, O oh God. I speak over all the students especially, Lord, everyone sitting here, O oh God, and those online. I pray, God, that each one of us will take a step of faith, Lord, and you will open the right doors for each one of us, O oh God, a door to minister to people, to share the gospel, to share what you have done in each of our lives, O oh God. And we thank you that we are not alone, that you are with us. And you will go before us, O oh God. Thank you for your grace and your mercy upon our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. I'll see you next week. God bless.